Excellent. So we are now recording for this tax processes for business revision session. And in this session, we're going to be taking a look at task seven and task eight in a mock. Now, these tasks are essentially going to revolve around payroll, which if you've been following this series on the previous revision sessions. Is not really something that has come up yet? But it is something that will come up in this exam. There's no two ways about it. So this session is really going to focus on those elements, which surprisingly do cause students issues sometimes. However, the theory, once you strip away all the jargon, is pretty simple. It's relatively functional mathematics in a lot of areas. So once we sort of take away that element of all of these different things that may or may not be, it's really, really not too bad. So for task seven, we start by looking at principles of payroll. Now, the AAT belief that you should spend, they're well, spending around 14 minutes on this. It's worth 12 more X. Now, again, I always say use that as a guide. Don't take it as an absolute gospel that you need to follow. It's just based on the amount of marks available proportionately uh, against the total amount of time in the exam. So obviously, more time should be spent on questions that give you more marks. But you will, of course, know your own working style and the tasks that you can do a bit quicker or a bit slower, much better than a statistic. OK, so again, this is why it's important. You practice the mocks, get comfortable. And in terms of what this task may be about, we may be asked questions about registration, pro uh, registration processes, I beg your pardon, the PAYE, pay as you earn, understanding key documentation, that employees must produce and retain. Any sort of deductions to employees' pay. Again, we'll start to get into that in a little bit. And calculating the net and gross pay and the cost of payroll to an employer. So there's a couple of things I do want to point out here. Again, if you've been following these series for quite a lot of the tasks we've been doing, I've sort of had the tagline, just check the reference material because it is a really handy guide. Now, there is payroll information in the reference material. However, what isn't in the reference material in terms of payroll is a couple of things, primarily calculations. OK, so when you sort of look at that, I believe all the payroll is official like point 20 onwards. Um, so you'll see a lot of different things on there regarding like different deadlines that you need to go to, the sort of different penalties and surcharges, all these different things that may or may not come up. What you will not get is calculation based work. So, for example, if you're calculating like gross pay, the reference material will not tell you what is included in that or vice versa. OK, so the, the financial figures, we're going to have to do a bit of work ourselves. But in truth, it's just a bit of simple mathematics. OK, and we'll see that as we go through this task. So let's start with the first bit that says, in part A, nice and easy, first of all, let's match the definitions below to the correct term. The first definition says that this is the amount an employee receives in their bank uh, for a pay period after all deductions have been made. Let's see another one again. Let's go through all these definitions and see what options we've got. Number two, the total earnings of an employee for a pay period. Number three, total earnings of an employee for a pay period after tax-free deductions. Number four, the amount earned by employees for different types of work. And I've got a multitude of different things to pick here. Taxable pay, net pay, pay rate, gross pay. So it stands to reason that each one of these options is going to go in its respective box, isn't it? Now, again, you need to understand the theory of payroll. You need to be comfortable with payroll. The general gist is we have our gross pay. We'll then deal with any sort of deductions. Again, we'll see this in action a little bit more as well. And what that essentially leaves us with is our net pay. Again, a bit, a bit of an oversimplification. We'll look at the finer points as we're going through this session. You need to be comfortable working this both ways. The same way that you sometimes, when you're calculating the AT, is sometimes you're given the net amount and you work out the gross amount. 
or vice versa. Sometimes you're given the gross amount and you have to calculate the net amount. Just be wary of that because, again, it's very possible that when you start having to do questions with figures in, just check, is it the net amount you've got? Is it the gross amount? We'll see this in action a little bit today as well. So the first one, uh, that definition says this is the amount uh, that, that an employee receives in their bank account for a pay period after all deductions have been made. Well, as our sort of quick little oversimplified illustration shows, I uh, see people put in the chat box, yes, that's relating. The net pay, because again, the net pay is the amount that ends up in that employee's bank accounts, the physical funds that they receive. Obviously, there will be deductions and stuff they have to be aware of. Definition number two says the total earnings of an employee for a pay period. Now, what the period is doesn't necessarily matter. This might be weekly, it might be monthly. But what it is, is the total earnings, which again, we've elaborated on this already, refers to gross pay. Remember, you will see this on your own pay slips because it's the big total you get before all the eye-watering deductions make their way off it. So I've taken a couple of things off my options already. Let's see what else we're left with. The total earnings of an employee for a pay period after tax-free deductions. Now, I've only really got two options here. I've got taxable pay and pay rate. If I'm talking about the total earnings after tax-free uh, tax deductions, it's going to be relating to taxable pay, isn't it? So again, as you should be aware of through your studies, there are certain things that we are essentially allowed to have tax-free. So for example, everybody is entitled to a personal allowance, things like in pension contributions, things like charitable donations. All of these are not taxed when we sort of, you know, sort of doing these pay packets, okay? We sort of say it's taxed at source. So personal allowances and stuff, they reduce that amount. It's essentially tax-free. Whatever you're left with becomes your taxable pay. Again, we're going to go on to deductions and stuff throughout these session, uh, this session. And finally, number four, I've only got one left, have that. The amount earned by employees for different types of work. Now, admittedly, and that's a bit of a woolly description, but ultimately, yes, it does refer to a pay rate. Different job roles, different places of business will pay their staff different, different rates. Um, you will perhaps earn different than your manager, a colleague, et cetera, et cetera. So the pay rate is what you earn. Um, again, you might be paid uh, different types of payments that you've seen. For example, the traditional ones like your salary-based ones, but throughout your AAT studies, if you haven't seen them already, you will see things around things like piecework payments, overtime bonuses, et cetera. None of that comes into this, to be honest with you. You're not going to be calculating overtime premiums or anything like that, but again, Taxable pay is the earnings for the period after any tax-free deductions, like personal allowances, like charitable donations, have been taken into account, okay? Let's keep going with this. Part B says, identify whether the following statements about payroll principles are true or false. That should say are false. We've had, it's a running theme in these videos, isn't it? It's like an Easter egg. Spot the spelling mistakes. Some way they've been a howler on these, haven't they? That should say true or false. Statement number one, let's see what it says. And let's see if we can identify if this is true or false. Again, this is just like general payroll trivia. No figures have come into this yet, but as you can sort of see at the bottom of this page, that's not going to be the case all the way through. Tax codes are used to determine the amount of tax-free earnings and are unique to each employee. Is that true or is that false? Well, that is true. Truthfully, you can sort of cobble answers together for this, even if you've never studied this unit before. If you've worked for any period of time, you will have perhaps received a letter from time to time saying your tax code has changed. This is your old tax code. This is your new one. The tax codes are essentially a 
well, it's a cording system. Again, you'll have seen these in that costing unit, for example. It's a cording system to allow um, HMRC to quickly identify what tax you should or shouldn't be paying and what amounts you should be charged respectively. So a higher earner who's on, I don't know, 50, 60,000 pounds a year will be on a, a different tax code than a lower earner that's earning 20,000 pounds a year. So yes, it's unique for each employee. You will know your own tax code. If not, you can go on to the government gateway and find it quite easily. Um, but yeah, that's it. Number two, employer pension contributions are deducted from gross pay. Not a problem, Robert. Thanks for joining us. Hope everything's okay. So statement number two says that employer pension contributions are deducted from gross pay. Now, I'm being told in the chat box that that is false. Interesting. So for the people that have said false, why? Because I've just said, have another, your gross pay minus your deductions is your net pay. So why wouldn't this fall under that remit? And there is a reason for this, and you have to be wary of it. Yes. Well, well done. Yeah, well done, Donna. Well done, Rachel employer pension contributions okay so again we've already spoke about tax-free deductions but this is the cost to the employer again you'll see this on your own pay slip there is your contribution and your employer's contribution the employer's pension contributions are not taken from your pay it is essentially an additional cost to the business let's make a note of that So that statement is false and well done for everybody that picked that up. They can be very, very careful of that. They will love to lay these slight ones because if it was employee contributions, and again, we might have to rethink how we're approaching that, but again, it's employer, it's a cost to the business. Statement number three. The total cost of payroll to the employer will be the gross pay, employees' national insurance, and employers' pension contributions. Again, tricky ones like this. And to be fair, a lot of this even sort of stems back from if you've done level two bookkeeping, like those payroll principles that you see either in bookkeeping controls if you did it on 2016 or principles of bookkeeping controls if you've done it on Q22, where you have to sort of lump the figures into the relevant T accounts. Not T accounts here, but the principle stays the same. As people have picked up on, this statement is false. Now, we've, yes, we've just identified that employer pension contributions are a cost to the business, but gross pay, yes, that is, but what about employees' national insurance? Because he was sort of touching on this there, he's saying, okay, it should be the employers, shouldn't it? Again, just subtle wordplay by the AAT. The employers national insurance contributions would be a cost to the business. The employee's contributions are a cost to the employee. Again, clever wordplay. Last but not least, a pay, uh, pay slip should be supplied to each employee on or before payday. Much nicer that one, isn't it? It was sort of gone from this uh, employee should be this, employee should be that, to a pay, a pay slip should be uh, given to each employee before payday. Now, yes, it should. Get mine after. Now, this does happen occasionally. I will explain this one. Um, the idea is, <clears throat> yes, it is good practice, okay? If you get your pay slip the same day that you get paid, just the way that bank transfers work, more often than not, at one minute past midnight, the funds have hit your bank account. So the funds are in your account before the pay slips have a chance to get to you. Realistically and truthfully, um, in the real world, like Rob just put, I get mine after. If you get it like the same day, it's fine. You, again, if it's done electronically, you, that wage will have been in your bank at one minute past midnight. The pay slip might not come through until half past eight in the morning when the accounts officers come in, made a brew and sent all the information out. Again, it does vary, but just be aware of that. The idea is from an admin perspective, it should be on or before. It shouldn't be like after, or like super far after. Again, after is quite a loose term. If it comes 10 minutes after, 
Is that a problem in the real world? Perhaps not. But again, it's good practice to get it on the day or beforehand. Right. <clears throat> Should we get some figures involved? We're told that Sammy Jo is an employee of Griffith Limited. She has queried the amount shown on the P60, and as it, as it does not agree with the amounts received during 2021-22, which totaled uh, £26,350.41. So you can see here that I've got this P60. Now, in your exam, you'll probably get an extract of the P60 in some description. Look very, very nasty, very, very complicated. It's really not that bad once you get to the groove of it, okay? So before I start looking at these figures, let's just see what it's asking me to do. So at this point, it's saying, okay, whatever is on the P60 doesn't agree with the amount that Sammy Jaw herself has received, okay? So by the looks of it, she's looking at this section, isn't she? That's 33,560. So she said, well, hang on a minute. It says here the total I got paid was 3356 or the only amounts I got in my bank were came to 26,350. And it says, so we just scroll down a little bit, complete the table below to reconcile the amounts that Sammy Joe received to the amount on her P60 in 2021-22. Now, again, these really throw people off sometimes, but they don't need to. Now, a couple of things to point out. When you're getting these types of questions, again, you, you might get an extract of a P60. Observations that you can make. The total that you've earned on a P60 should come to these three boxes total together. So your earnings at the lower limit, the primary threshold, and the upper limit. Truthfully, you don't really start messing around with the limits or anything like that. This is just a bit of an FYI. These figures should come to your gross total. Truthfully, don't ask me what you do if you don't, because I've never seen a question where that is the case, okay? Yeah, these three figures simply come to the total, shouldn't be an issue. That's not where the discrepancy is, okay? But again, there's just one thing to be aware of. Now, we can see what's perhaps happened here. So this was like the total earned. The 26,000 is the total paid. That's what we're trying to say. Remember, we know I'm going to have that gross pay, whatever it may be. I'm then going to make any relevant deductions. That's going to leave me with that net pay figure, isn't it? Now, if I've just said that the 35, uh, 33,000 is the gross pay and the 26,000 is the net pay, because that's what Sammy Joe has received in her bank account, what I now need to do is look at all the other information I'm given and say, okay, well, are there any deductions here that would make the reconciliation balance? So are there any figures that would make this agree? Things to watch, again, it looks really complicated. Just look at what you've been told. So first of all, yeah, deductions, well done, Donna. I've got this figure here, tax deducted, 4,205 and 20. Now, I am reliably informed, and I do have this written down here, is you should only get income from one job, okay? So obviously sometimes if you swap jobs during a year, you might have it from like this bit on previous employments. I'm, I have been reliably informed that's not gonna come up in this exam, okay? So don't worry about that. But I can see that there has been some tax deducted from the gross pay of 4,205. But if I put this in here, for example, and say, when we're looking at this, that tax deducted, £4,205.20. Now, if I put that in a calculator, mm, still not quite there, is it? So this, I'm still a bit short here. So there must be something else. And the question looks like that is giving me a good hint because I've got another box here as well. So I'd say, okay, 
I've taken off a deduction, but let me look at all the other information I've got. Are there any other deductions here, things like tax, national insurance? Is there anything that is reducing the amount of gross pay available? And as people have picked up on, actually there is, isn't there? Let's look at this column here. If my highlighter works. Contributions on all earnings above the partial, uh, the big part of the primary threshold. There's a national insurance contribution of £3,004.39. If it helps, think of your pay slip. You will have your gross pay figure. You will have pay, um, I'm going to say black pay E then, pay as you earn, P A Y E, and you'll have national insurance on there. It's the same principle, it's just on a P60 now as opposed to a pay slip. So that is another deduction that has taken place here. Let's put it in. I'll just be careful with the pick list here. This is the employee's national insurance contribution. Okay, because it says there, national insurance contributions in this employment. This is the employee's. It's a P60 personal to an individual. Let's put it in. Oh, so I'll scroll it down quickly so everyone can see the option boxes as well. So that employees. National insurance contributions, which we've just worked out, come to 3,004 and 39 pence. Now, if I punch all that in the calculator, does that make the difference? So just be careful here because obviously it's not calculating from top to bottom, but AKA again, this is your net amount and this is your gross amount. You calculate from the bottom up. Okay, so again, if you start, a couple of different ways you can do it, you can add the amounts onto the net, you can take those amounts off the gross, but by doing that, do the figures agree with each other? Yes, they do. The reconciliation is now complete. And that is it for questions like this. Again, they give you all this information and it, it, it looks just absolutely awful to be completely honest with you, but it really, really doesn't need to be that. You shouldn't see any pay slips in this exam for what it's worth as well. But the concept of this is relatively simple, okay? P60 shows the gross amount paid. What is in the employee's bank account will be different because that's the net pay. Just pick out the figures, find tax, pay as you earn, national insurance contributions. That's all you're looking for. You're looking for those core things that reduce something from the gross to the net. Just because they give you this big fancy table, the theory doesn't change. I'll be pleased to know <clears throat> that brings us to task eight. We are at the threshold and we've got one task to go. Now, this is payroll continued. Again, this um, section of the exam is payroll. I know of people who don't like payroll and didn't want to do it last when they were a bit frazzled after doing everything else in the exam. So they jumped straight to the last two tasks to get it done first. So again, just be time management. Think about what works best for you. So as it says, about reporting VAT and payroll information, about eight marks, about 10 minutes to complete it. What do we need to do? We need to understand the reporting process to HMRC. We need to understand the approval process for payroll and reporting pay as you earn. The communication methods of this, email or memo. Communication of the effect of a VAT return resulting in a payment or a, or a reclaim of your pardon, from HMRC. Who needs to be informed of changes in legislation and why? Advise relevant people by email or memo. So again, this is more about the reporting function, okay? The reference material will come in handy for a lot of the dates and stuff. You'll see that as we start to go through this. I'm going to go back to my, my old saying, check the reference material, because it does come very, very handy uh, in this task. It says, you are an accounts assistant for Doggy Daker, and your responsibilities include the preparation of payroll. Lucky you. Supervisor of the support staff approves all hours worked. All payments are prepared by the business owner who is responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the business. 
Payments to HMRC are made quarterly by faster payments. The year-end financial statements are prepared by external, uh, the external accountant, I beg your pardon. You have prepared the wages report for the quarter ending June 22 as follows. Now, before we get into the amounts, quite a lot to digest here, isn't there? We haven't really seen a question with this much information in it at this point. Now, what it's doing here, it is it's essentially showing you the chain of command. Who does what? Who is responsible for what? And then what you're going to see in these questions is, okay, well, for this piece of information, whatever it may be, who should you report it to? Should it go to, example, the external accountants? Should it go to the supervisor for the staff? Should it go to the business owner? So just check the information. No names given, but we don't need names. Just have an idea of those different roles and responsibilities. What is the supervisor responsible for? For example, if I need to check the amount of hours worked by somebody, I'm not going to go to the external accountant. It's the responsibility and it falls within the role of the supervisor. Again, that's the logic you need to build here. Now it says that, okay, we prefer, uh, prepared that wages report. We've got a few different things. Gross wages, income tax, national insurance contributions, employment allowances. Okay, don't need to do much with that yet. We'll see if we have to deal with it in a little while, okay? Part A, identify who you will send the wages report to for approval. Again, this is like the roles and responsibilities. So what it's worth doing is saying, okay, who are my options? The external accountant, HMRC, or the business owner? What do these do? The external accountant, the year-end financial statements, are prepared by the external accountant. Okay. Does he need the wages report for the quarter ended June 22? Probably not. So it seems like he's the appropriate person here. Payments to HMRC are made quarterly by a faster payment. Okay, well, what's HMRC's role and responsibility? Well, they don't have a role in the business. They just will get tax. Again, it sounds a bit obvious, doesn't it? There's no, they don't have a role in the business. Their responsibility is to get the tax off you that is due to be paid. All payments are prepared by the business owner who is responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the business. But it stands to reason that we're going to send it to the business owner because he's the one that is ultimately going to be paying this. Should we do it again? Identify. Uh, so we saying, interesting, our wages are prepared by an external accountant and improved. Yeah, again, this, this is an example. So what you will get, Rob, is, and it's probably a good point to mention, you'll get a scenario. The reality is no two companies will do this exactly the same, okay? So the way your company might do it will be vastly different from the way the company does it next door. Perhaps the company in the business across from you has an internal payroll department where they don't use external accountants for it. Other ones will do it differently. So that's why it's important you'll check the scenario and when you get you're doing your practice questions and you're doing these practice marks you will see the different ways it may or may not be done it's not an exhaustive list again there's loads of different ways of doing it but yes yeah, it is it's a good good example there because it shows again how different companies will do this differently to what suits them best so for this one i'm looking at who we send the report to to complete year-end financial statements Again, I just checked the roles and responsibilities. I can see very, very clearly roles and responsibilities. The external accountants prepare the year end financial statements. So it's going to be them. Not going to be HMRC. Again, they just want the tax. It's not going to be the business owner. The business owner is dealing with the day to day running. He's not producing the statements. Terrific. Let's look at this. A3. Complete the following details about the payroll information. So first of all, what amount is due to HMRC? I've got all the figures I need here. I just need to find out what is going where. And again, this 
sort of bleeds back into like level two bookkeeping, to be honest, because you you sort of do this in those uh, exams where you put everything in the relevant T accounts. You'll have like a HMIC account, uh, pensions contributions account, et cetera, et cetera. The exact same thing, but all I'm doing now is just adding the figures together. So I'm going to look at the information here and say, okay, out of the amounts listed, which of these will ultimately end up in the pocket of HMIC? That's what I'm trying to establish here. Where does that, uh, these, that money ultimately end up? So gross wages, no, that doesn't all end up in the pocket of HMIC, doesn't it? Again, the gross wages will be split up as is needed. Income tax. Now that will end up at HMIC, won't it? Because including the name, it's a tax. What else? National insurance contributions. Because again, these are paid to HMIC. Employment allowances. Now, that's actually, they don't, they're going to be careful of this because the employment allowances is actually a, de a deduction. Just be careful of that if it does come up. Again, you will get, um, yeah, if Moody's just put there, just be careful of that if it does pop up, okay? Because the employment allowance is one that they do like to catch you up on. So let's put these together. So we've got 1436.97 plus 9348.65. Plus 1056.76. Push all that into your calculator, it gives you £3,428.38. I will put those figures down here as well. So that is, pardon, let me do it. One, seven, pardon, my pen is having a bit of a moment here. Give me two seconds, guys. There we go, apologies, my, the tip of my pen seems to just pick and choose when it wants to work sometimes. Okay, first one, sorry, income tax, £1,436.97, that's right there. 1436.67 plus 4, employees national insurance, £934.65. Plus £1,056.76. Given us that total, £3,428.38. Okay. Now, this is an interesting one. The amount must be paid to HMRC by. This is where it starts to get a little tricky, or does it? Spoiler alert, check the reference material. Now the reference material will tell you that this payment would be due, as I can see people are putting in the chat box, which is great, on the 22nd of every month, providing it is paid electronically, okay? That is the trick, and again, it does say what those sort of different dates, depending on the different types used. So again, it's about point 0.22, It's way, way at the back of the reference material, but it will say like payroll deadlines for things like your registration, uh, for pay as you earn, um, again, just these different ones. And again, for electronic payments, which does that fall under this remit? Well, payments are made quarterly by faster payments, obviously faster payments are Electronic payments, so they fall under that category. It will be the 22nd of July. Last but not least for this part is the amount due to HMRC can be paid quarterly as the average monthly pays you earn payment is less than what? Spoiler alert. 
Oh, here we go. My pen is not happy this evening, but there we go. It's in the reference material. Now, again, it's falling under the average, as I see people have put, of 1,500 pounds. Again, this is all in the payroll deadline section of the reference material. Because it's, yes, and again, it just catches people out sometimes. Because as a long on it, it's 3,000. It's well over the 1,500. But again, it's average. This is for, the, excuse me, this is for the quarter. Divide that by three. It then falls under the average amount. A uh, big point, the average amount then falls under the threshold. So, yes, it can be paid quarterly. Last couple of bits. We're nearly there. Bit of a shorter revision session tonight. I said that. It's nearly, it's getting close to 22 already, isn't it? Let's get this last little bit done. Which of the following statements are true regarding late submission of payroll filings, payments? Goody, goody, goody. You know where you're going to look. Have a nosy in the reference material. It will help unbelievably with these. So which statements are true? The first statement. And again, let's read all the statements and then we'll see if we can pick out the two correct ones or pick out the false one because then by the product of elimination, we should have the two right ones. So statement number one says that penalties may apply if the full payment submission was filed late. Okay. Statement number two says that penalties are payable at the same rate, irrespective of whether the error is due to carelessness or whether they are deliberate and concealed. Statement number three, penalties may apply if the employer uh, payment summary was not filled when you did not pay an employee's tax in a month. Okay. So two of these are true. One of these is false. Now, I think, again, the truth of this mock overall is quite nice. One of these sort of stands out as wrong to me more than the other ones maybe stand out as true in the first instance. And that's statement number two. Penalties are payable at the same rate, irrespective of whether the error is due to carelessness or whether they are deliberate and concealed. That doesn't sound right, does it? You've sort of seen these different concealed, as on the back return, for example, different types of errors can yield different charges. The percentage is not the same. Because again, a small innocent blunder, would that be dealt with in the same fashion as say a deliberately concealed error? No, 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 I don't think it would, would it? Same thing with the back returns. It just doesn't work like that. Is it curless? Is it deliberate? Or again, is it concealed? Different rates, again, all available in the reference material, which means the other two, I'm hoping, are true because I'm after two correct answers and I've only got two left. Penalties may apply if the full payment submission was filed late. Now, again, in the reference material on point 24, it literally says penalties may apply if, and the first point is the FPS was late. So that statement is uh, spot on. Penalties may apply if the employer payment summary, you might see this abbreviated to EPS, was not filed when you did not pay any employees in a tax month. That is true. Again, on that reference material, point 24, it says an EPS was not filed. Quite a nice one, again, it just sort of directly going to the reference material and just picking out the correct piece of information to be completely honest with you. But with that, we've actually come to the end of this mock assessment overall. So what I'm going to do now is very quickly stop the recording.